here's Leonard all the way from Ohio coming to see us and say hello Leonard how you doing I'm good Ted how are you man oh I'm doing good I'm I'm surviving here in, in the uh, the jungle the concrete jungle they call Honolulu and uh, where are you coming to us uh, we're starting small, so please bear with me. Don't get discouraged, people. We're, we're going to grow like the tiny acorn into the mighty oak. But, but Leonard, is, uh, Leonard is a musician. He's a Christian music musician, worship leader, minister. And we've been friends, uh, I don't know, a long time. Seems like been um, forever, but... Uh, we met uh, 15 years ago, I guess, when you and your wife came and visited us in Hawaii and played some churches here, and we got to hang out, and we had a great time. And, and since that time, I, I, I used to be an airline pilot. I don't know if the people view and know that, but uh, I had the honor to fly you to Japan. You were going to Japan quite a lot, and you were traveling the world, and playing music and teaching uh, worship. And uh, I want to hear a little bit about some of your adventures. But tell me first, tell me where did this all begin? Tell me how you got started. and Where were you born, Leonard? I was born in Schenectady, New York. Uh, that's uh, a little kind of upstate New York. Oh. And... Uh, and at a young age, we moved to Florida, and and then for about my the first fourteen years of my life, my father was, he worked in the shipyards, and and in Florida there was the shipyards in Jacksonville, Florida, but up in New York there was the atomic powerhouses, and uh, so he was a specialized welder, so he he could weld you know the the, the stuff that you would use in a atomic powerhouse uh and it's a uh, so uh we would live in florida for a year literally sell the house move to new york for two years sell the house move to florida because back then you just you didn't just rent houses you just bought them you know and um so anyway i grew up uh at, at a age of four I my father had a whole bunch of musicians come over to our house and uh, and they were all playing and my dad was singing and that uh, that changed my life and uh, when did you discover that you had some talent for music when did you realize that you wanted to do music in your life Probably when I was about four. Our, our little screens have gotten bigger for some reason. Yeah, I'm trying to monkey around with this. It's not working. Uh, so, and then you I kept going at it. You know, started out on a ukulele. You know, from there I went to a. I think it, it was a silver tone, four string guitar. It's like taking the top four strings of a six string guitar, just the high strings and got that. And then, and then when I was somewhere around the age of maybe 10 or something, I, uh, my dad had built, bought a silver tone guitar that was, that had the, the amplifier was inside of the guitar case. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I got rid of that guitar and guess who I saw playing the exact same guitar about 20 years later was Jimmy Page with uh, Led Zeppelin. And I'm going, you got rid of that guitar. Ah. <laughs> uh, and so anyway, uh, I, uh, I started playing in band. I started taking guitar lessons at 13 from a very good jazz player. By the time I was 14, I was actually playing in clubs with him, uh, doing jazz type music. And um, and then I got ruined when I was 16. And uh, when Cream, a group called Cream with Eric Clapton came out. Oh yeah. Went, oh my gosh. 
Now that's how to play the guitar. And so my my guitar teacher hated me for it, you know, because he was a strict jazz player. Uh, at the age of 19, pretty much right on my birthday, I went into the Air Force and uh, got stationed in Germany, played in bands when I was there in the Air Force. Um, when I got out of the Air Force, I went. To, uh, I thought, well, what am I going to do? I, I can't. So I went into went to music college. I had the GI Bill. Uh, studied uh, composition theory. Went through four years of that, uh, and played with the Jacksonville Symphony for a couple of years. Had bands. I had a band um, with uh, just a whole bunch of different bands. But, and then I, I uh, ended up working uh, at uh, CBN with Pat Robertson for a while. And after that, I went to PPL with Jim Baker. And when that fell apart, uh, uh, oh, be in between that, I had a band with a couple of guys from a group called Leonard Skinner, uh, Billy Powell and uh, uh, Leon Wilkerson, who was bass player and keyboard player. They're both dead now, but uh, they had gotten saved. Uh, that group was called Vision. And they, you can actually still, on YouTube, you can find Vision there's no videos, but there's a lot, a lot of the music. Just put, just type in Vision, Billy Powell, Leon Wilkerson, or Leonard Skinner or something like that. Leonard Skinner. And so from that, I went, uh, I worked, worked at PTL. PTL fell apart. Uh, and somehow or another, I got hooked up with a guy named Rick Joyner after that and rick joiner uh had written a book uh, called um there were two trees in the garden and it, it was a pretty big uh hit and i went on board with them <clears throat> uh they, he didn't have any churches or anything he paid me to go out in the woods in a little cabin and just worship the lord by myself and so that was my job you know, I clocked in and I went back and worshiped the Lord for eight hours. And um, so I cut my teeth on uh, a lot of Christian worship during that time. You know, up until that time, I'd played like maybe um, like Christian rock. Like the, the, the group Vision was, it, it sounded like Leonard Skinner singing worship songs. Uh, and uh, we had two albums that are very good albums. And so I'm just trying to make a real quick. Uh, so I was, I was with Morningstar for 20 years. So when did that start? When What year are we talking about now? What period? The 80s, uh, 70s? At Morningstar, I started in 93. Okay. I believe it was 93. Um, in 1996, we cut four pretty successful CDs, all, all from the same uh, conference called uh, Vision, uh, Worship, Glory, and Warfare. And they became uh, huge sellers. I mean, and to this day, if you talk with the people at Bethel or if you talk to the people I'm working with right now, uh, Christ, Christ for All Nations with Daniel Kalenda. Those those were the albums that changed their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because nobody was doing anything creative up until that time. And, uh, it, and so we became very, very popular. Our conferences were huge. And um, it would... Uh, it would not be uncommon for during a conference to look out and of course we didn't know who they were, but you know, Brian and Jen Johnson would be in the audience, you know, or Jason Upton. A lot of people came just to see what was going on because of the worship that we were producing. And this was in, uh, in the barn, I think they called it, wasn't it? The big building there more, this was in the nineties. Is that right? Yeah, we did, we, did, we did stuff in the barn. We did stuff in Jacksonville, Florida at uh, New Life. We did mm -hmm. hotel hotels around. 
<coughs> excuse me, and um, and then about ten years ago, uh, I quit and started doing uh, worship schools around the world. And that was when I started going to Japan a lot, and I was going to Brazil crazy, you know. Uh, I think I went to Japan 10 times. I went to Brazil probably 20 times. Um, uh, all over the Middle East, all over uh, Europe, you know. Uh, and and then, uh, you know, to be honest, I just got tired of traveling. Yeah, I can identify with that as a pilot. And uh, you were hitting it hard. I know you were gone all the time. Sometimes uh, I'd buy those tickets that you could go one direction and go all the way around the world. <laughs> you know, wow. I would buy a, a, a literally, literally around the world ticket. I'd go to England and I'd go to Europe, you know, and then I'd go to Japan and then I'd go to Australia and then I'd go to Hawaii. I think on one of those trips I stopped in mm -hmm. Hawaii. I've, I've got probably hundreds of influences. I've gone through stages where I, um, I'll pick up uh, like an instrument and just learn how to play it just because I've heard it somewhere. That's how I learned how to play the violin. I was, uh, I would have been somewhere around 19 or 20 and, and I, there was a band back in those days, nobody had ever heard violin in a rock band. Um, and I heard this band called It's a Beautiful Day. And, and I heard the violin. I went, I'm going to learn how to play that. And I found, and I got me a violin and, uh, uh, in Germany. And, uh, when I came back to the United States, practiced it for about um, six weeks or so, um, no, six months and learned a Bach, uh, sonata, uh, violin sonata piece. And, and I went to the college uh, there and I, I had only been playing for six months and I played, um, uh, violin, I played, played it for him and I got a full-time scholarship. So that's how I ended up going to music school. Are you still there? You're not, I don't see you. I'm here. I didn't go away. I just wanted to spotlight you while you were talking okay, and <laughs> you're getting lonely. Okay. Oh, <laughs> learned about a lot of instruments that way and a lot of styles. Um, I, I went through a huge classical music st uh, part of my life. I went through uh, bluegrass stage. I went through Irish music stage. I went through Indian uh, music, uh, you know, for India, not American Indian. I obviously went through the rock and roll stage and I'd never gotten out of that. Uh, and I, went through a jazz stage where that's all I wanted to play was jazz. Uh, so all of those influences consequently come up in my music. Like you, like I can have one song that sounds very much like an Irish jig, you know, and, but the next song I do could sound like something you'd hear, you know, in, you know, Russia somewhere. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just, it just kind of depends on, so, but my writing style, it changes all the time. I just get these ideas in my head and like the symphony I wrote, uh, I'm almost finished with. Um, I, I, I ended up taking, I went, I was, um, I, t I took a film scoring class at Berkeley last year. And right, right. And then, um, so the first part of this year, I took a, um, advanced orchestration class uh at berkeley and i really uh i really liked it and uh, i actually took one of my irish fiddle tunes and used it and orchestrated it it's called king's kids uh you can find it on uh, youtube mm -hmm. uh and and then i uh you know the COVID thing started really bearing down on us and so i just had a lot of time you know, to write. So I just was writing while I was, uh, as soon as I finished that course, that was, a. I think that, start, that ended in April. I just started writing the symphony. Uh, and uh, I call it um, uh, symphony, uh, 
CV XIX. That's you named it for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I call it a it's a uh, symphonic diary of COVID-19. And it's very good. The problem is symphonies aren't playing anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, there's mm -hmm. you can't go see a symphony right now. Mm -hmm. I can't even get even any of the major symphonies to look at it. Uh, the, uh, I did get one. I, I've gotten a couple of groups. One, of, one, one was a, an online symphony that, you know, puts together these online uh, videos of them doing a symphony. And uh, the guy wrote me back and he really loved it. He said, but it's just too hard for them. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's just a lot. There's a lot going on. Uh, they were doing stuff like Brahms, but the easy Brahms, not the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm a little bit discouraged on that. I'm on. I'm on. I, I wrote. I finished three movements, which is about forty minutes worth of music. Mm -hmm. And I was. I'm about three and a half minutes into the fourth movement. And I've kind of like not been doing it because then my worship school started up here, and I just didn't have time to do it. Uh, so. Uh, Anyway, that's how that, you know, but, but about, uh, I think it was two years ago, I was up here in Cleveland and, uh, I was doing, uh, uh the, the call with, uh, Lou Engel and I was mm -hmm. with, uh, um, uh, Rick Pino. I can't remember who else I, I, I'm not sure if Misty was at that conference or not. Um, uh, but, um. Uh, and I'm sitting on the sideline, you know, just waiting for Rick to go on. And this guy came up to me, big old muscular guy. And he goes, hey, my name's Daniel. And it was Daniel Kalenda. And he goes, man, I, I grew up in your music. I, I it, it, like, you're one of the best musicians I know. And he said, uh, uh, and, and he's just, oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so um, he said, felt like, you know, that we're going to do something together someday. And mm -hmm. then he went to Morningstar a few months after that and did a conference with us. And he said the same thing. And then for about a year went by and I hadn't heard from him. Now, about six months ago, he, uh, he, you know, wrote me, I mean, he called me and and he said, you know, I'd really be interested in um, you doing your worship school here in uh, Orlando with us. And and so I, uh, we've been in a lot of uh, negotiations on that. And uh, uh, January the 28th, we're doing a conference in Orlando. It's called the Fire Conference. It's... Uh, Todd White is going to be there, Daniel Kalenda, uh, uh, a whole bunch of really good speakers. Uh, Sean Foyt's going to be doing worship. So is uh, uh, me and Amber Brooks and Eddie James, uh, Naomi, Naomi Cantrell, uh, Jenny Weaver. So it's going to be a pretty, pretty amazing conference. Uh, and uh, after that conference, I'm actually going to stay in Florida and start working at CPAN, you know, getting the getting the curriculum all set up for the school. Cool, cool. Now, <clears throat> now, but you were doing, you had Kevin Prosh and you had Don Potter uh, and you guys were changing everything, I, I think, and everybody else seemed to think so. And that was uh, in the 90s, right? And and uh, and it went from there. I, I you know I believe that you are one of the fathers of the contemporary Christian music uh, movement. And uh, you know, as a father, uh, you influence many younger people, and you have a lot of of artists now that you help bring up. You'd mention them: Luke Skagg, Molly Skaggs, and. Uh, what other artists uh, have you been, you know, you felt you've had input to and contact with? I'm sure there's a many, too many to count, but 
uh, not that they're more important, but you, who who would you think that people might know, or who did you have a big influence on? Well, we had a ministry school that that had worship track uh, at Morning Star, and we had uh, John Mark McMillan and Sarah McMillan. Uh, they came through that school. John wrote, John Mark wrote a song called "Oh How He Loves Us," and uh, and then Sarah wrote a couple of years ago a song called um, King of My Heart we had Johnny and Melissa Halser come through our school uh, John, Johnny you know uh, was you know uh, what's the name of that song uh, ain't, uh, No Longer Slave uh, Kim Walker came through for a term uh, we had um, Josh Baldwin who's now with Bethel that uh, he came through, Amber Brooks, who, who will be working with me at CFAN. She came through the school. Uh, Kalani, a girl named Kalani Glipper, uh, came through also. Uh, just a number of, and there, there's a number of musicians that not, you know, that weren't extremely, never got really famous, but their, their songs are just, ridiculously beautiful and, and um and we had we had an emphasis on um creativity and on individuality at morning star and that's really the hallmark of my schools that i do is uh we're you know uh in order to have longevity to what you do uh, you have to either have any crazy good style, you know, that will last or you have to have a lot of education so that you can move through the stages that, that happen in, in music and in the uh, worship world. Um, mm -hmm. I happen to have a lot of education, so I've been able to kind of stay ahead of the curve most of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I believe... Uh, and that's what I try to instill into my students. It's like, okay, if, if, if this is what you want to do for your life, you really have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. You can't just go in, uh, uh, you know, you have those people that have made it through, you know, like if, if Stevie Wonder went out on the road right now, he's probably close to 75 at least. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. He would sell out everywhere he went because mm -hmm. he has a style but he's also a fantastic musician you know, yeah the same yeah. with paul mccartney the same with uh you know uh, uh, there's just a just a whole bunch of the musicians that came up during that era uh uh you know uh, elton john any of those guys they can draw an audience you know and you, these are old people like me yeah you yeah know? Uh, and because they created a style, you know, and there's a word for the, the words, I can't remember the, the actual Greek word, uh, but the, it's a, and you might, since you're Greek, it, the, the word for education is actually, they use, it's not putting, it's not putting th something into somebody, it's pulling something out of them. Exactly right. Yeah. I mean, it's bring out, draw out from you from inside. And that's, yeah. that's what my schools are about. We're not, well, I mean, we, you have to put something in sometimes to get it out. And, you know, mm -hmm. but, but my whole thing, like tomorrow, uh, uh, now this, la this school, uh, be it was, uh, because of COVID, you know, it, it's very small Four I had four full-time students. And, but if every one of those students, well, five, five including my intern. Uh, uh, every one of those students are going to be doing a an original song that they wrote, uh, and and the styles are crazy different. You know, one of them is a just a blatant rock song. The other sounds like it could have been written in nineteen thirties. Uh, uh, a Russian girl that is uh, who actually has been living at Marla and my house during school. Uh, she wrote that, oh, and we have one of the uh, the pastor's daughter-in-law. Uh, she came through the school. Her songs, uh, maybe uh, I think it's kind of a, uh, a a 
it's a really good worship song. And then uh, then uh, another one of my students, uh, his song is, is it's, a, it's a little bit kind of folky, you know, so we have four different styles tomorrow. Plus, I'll be doing a song. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, uh, I it's on YouTube. If you if you put on YouTube, uh, Leonard Jones slash Mozart. Right. We start doing. We start with uh, me and a string quartet doing a Mozart string quartet, and then I go into Keep My Eyes on You, where we're actually doing a version of that song tomorrow with with the Mozart. Uh, and so. Uh, you know, God is uh, God is very creative, and He likes creative. He's drawn to creativity, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I I definitely I definitely agree with you, and that's one of the things that I have loved so much about you and what you've done for me and many other people. Uh, is show us that there's not any right and wrong or just one way, but you can be yourself, bring your own music in. Now here we are. Well, <laughs> Let's jump back. <laughs> this is the here. this is the barn, right? <laughs> right. And this is the early early days. We're going to see very young Leonard Jones. This is back to, to the nineties here. Me with me with the, me with a ball. <laughs> this is one of your really classic big ones called We Wait. Here later. So, yeah, I, I just didn't want to miss this part. Please go ahead with the story so that she found Robert Plant alone in the studio and she asked to pray for him. Well, uh, she didn't know who he was. Uh huh. Uh, she just walked up to her and she, she asked him, uh, Do you mind if I pray for you? And, and uh, he goes, No, I go ahead. And so she started praying for him and then she started giving him the the word and he just started crying and just the lord was just all over him and um you know uh at when the, they left uh, allison cross is a christian so she was kind of used to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so when they left on on their way back to the house um uh christine asked donna she goes who was that guy <laughs> and mm -hmm. don goes uh oh you don't you didn't know who that was that that's Robert Plant. That's the lead singer for Led Zeppelin. And she goes, oh. <laughs> so that's... <laughs> that way. She, she's like a... Uh, she, she's John like, the Baptist. She's a fire <laughs> Pentecostal full on. But it, it, it seems that they had an effect on him. I mean, absolutely. Uh, he seemed to be talking more about different kind of things about, you know, not the normal Led Zeppelin stuff. Right. Yeah. And you never know. I mean, we're talking about religion and church and those things, but actually it seemed like church is, uh, is, the, is us, the people, and we have to take it outside, outside the four walls. And, that's what you're very good at doing. And uh, uh, you were in Philadelphia, I understand, back here uh, a couple months ago. You were playing at uh, Constitution Hall, you and some, some musicians. The field outside of that, yes. Yeah. Well, um, I know that you, you know, you traveled and you, you know, you made your living just as traveling teacher, evangelist, musician. You told me about a time in Europe, you said, when, you know, everybody that's in ministry and probably more ministry people would be interested in this. But 
you do things by faith and you live by faith and you only just take offerings. You don't charge like just charge money, you know, but um, you told me once about a, a time when, uh, when you were in Germany or somewhere, you said you got the biggest offering you ever had. You were in a small little attic room with a few people and you had a, some kind of ice cream carton or something you were, Passion, do you remember that by any chance? You remember the uh, particulars? You told me your biggest offering, I think you, at least from that whole world trip, just from a room with 10 people, and you had a empty cardboard uh, ice cream carton for the <laughs> for the collection basket. Uh, I don't know. It stuck with me. You probably don't remember, but. But nowadays, that they charge uh, artists charge actual fees to do things, and uh, it's it's all completely changed. It's all turned around a lot. So I see you moving around. You have a guitar handy there. Do you or do you have something? You uh, you have something? Maybe you would like to do something for us. Uh, I know you have a Christmas album. And maybe we're getting a little long. We might need to wrap up here. This is just for our first time. But I sure appreciate people watching. And I, I know they're going to be watching in the future. And uh, we're going to do more, hopefully, Lord willing. But would certainly love to, uh, you know, hear you to be able to hear you do something if you'd like. And you have a Christmas album. It's just brand new out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't yeah, but I, I just whatever you feel like you would like to do, we we would sure we would enjoy something. Uh, uh, the album is called Silent Night, and it's uh, it's a sea fan, uh, fresh for all nations. It's uh, me and a good friend up here. We just got into my office and we just recorded violin mainly and piano, and did uh, a bunch of Christmas songs, you know, traditional all traditional songs. And then Daniel Kalenda and his family did uh, some narrations over the songs. Uh, album, Christmas album, please. Here's Le Leonard. Uh, this is a song I wrote with uh, John Mark McMillan. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I I haven't even, I haven't done it in quite a while, so bear with me. No greater love this world has seen. darkest grave it could not keep the purest heart lay drained forth out upon the mercy seat oh, what
as you love me, your mercy see. I bring my sin, you take my grief. gods of men they stand aside their eyes are blind to my life and when my heart oh, how's it go no longer be I'll sit with you upon the mercy seat. My praise belongs to you. Cause it's all that I can. the one who was, who will always be above the mercy seat. You love your mercy seat. Remembered it. Oh, that's awesome, Leonard. Um, can we have you back again sometime? Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, thank you. This has been awesome. Well, this has been our special guest, Leonard Jones, and we had an up close and personal visit and talk with Leonard. And thank you, Leonard. Thanks for sharing. At this Christmas time, we just pray for peace, peace on earth, and goodwill toward men. Amen. Amen. Hey, Leo, thanks again. Uh, it's been an awesome privilege, <laughs> and I really enjoyed talking with you. Me too, man. Okay, we'll do it again soon. And come and come and I <laughs> thank you, Leonard. And coming live from Honolulu, checking out today, saying aloha, peace. We love you all. God bless you. Aloha. Thank you. Avida Zand. <laughs> see you. See you soon. Bye, Leonard. Thanks.